All right, good afternoon, everybody. Is it afternoon yet? No, it's good morning still. OK, um, so I'm going to complete the last lecture. Uh, and then I have to go back and tell you there's something I missed in one of the notebooks um, that I should go back and tell you about very quickly. Then I think we're going to go and look at um, quoting in more detail so that you find out exactly what you have to quote and how you do it. Um, and then we'll see if there's any time left from there. Uh, and if there is, we'll go on to another notebook. So we were talking about redirection, right? So if you have a command that sends its output to standard output, so the terminal, uh, then you can redirect that output somewhere else, right? The, the way you redirect it is with the um, greater than sign, right? You can put the one in front of it to indicate that you're redirecting standard output, but you don't have to. Uh, now, sometimes you don't want to just redirect. Right, so if you redirect uh, output to a file, um, if the file doesn't exist, it creates the file and then writes the uh, output to the file. If the file already exists, then it overwrites the, the existing file. Right? And so if you just use plain old redirection, it, um, you lose what used to be in the file. Right? Now, sometimes this is what you want, sometimes it's not. Right? So sometimes if you want to output stuff and you want to store it at the end of an existing file, that's when you use the double greater than sign, right? So two greater than signs will append to the end of the file. All right, so let's just try this out quickly. I just wanna check if there's anything interesting in this directory. Okay, there's nothing terribly interesting in this directory. Uh, well, let's just use this one. So if I list the contents, I get that, right? If I list the contents and then redirect to files, I get no output, but if I look at files, right? If I look at, sorry, files, right, then you can see that there's some stuff there, right? Uh, now, if I do the same command again, this time appending, right, so double greater than sign, right? and now if I look at files, you'll see that files contain, oh, sorry, right? You see that it now contains uh, the output twice, right, because I appended to the end of the file. So if you're doing something like keeping a log, uh, a log of some of your program that's running, you want to output information about the running state of your program, right, that's when you'd want to append to the end of a file. Right? If you're computing a bunch of stuff and you need to repeat commands to, um, uh, to compute, what it, uh, compute whatever it is you're computing, right, then you might append the result of each command to the end of a file, right, so that you have a permanent record of the uh, output of those commands. If you need to redirect standard error for some reason, uh, then you can specify, that's where you specify the, uh, the file descriptor two, right? So file descriptor two is the file descriptor for standard error. Uh, and so when you get an error message, typically a command prints the error message to the stream standard error, which by default goes to the terminal, right? If you wanna capture that information and send it somewhere else, redirect it. So, uh, there's no file called zzz in bin, right? So if I do ls bin slash z star, right? You look at the output, there's no file called zzz, right? So if I ask ls to list information about the file fruit bin zzz, that's an error, right? So ls access, oh, cannot access bin zzz, no such file or directory, right? That message actually gets set, sent to standard error. So if I redirect standard error to error.txt, right? now there's no error output, right? So you, there's no output to the terminal. Uh, but there is a file called error.txt and it contains the error message. Right? So if I ls bin z, z star, so if I ask ls to list information about all files that start with z in bin, and if I ask ls to list information about the file bin zzz, right, that will produce error output to standard output and to standard error, right? So let me uh, get rid of the redirection first and we'll see what it outputs, right? So one, there is a message to standard error, right? Can't access the file bin zzz, and then there's output to standard out, right? So if I want to, I can just redirect uh, the output the error output 
to a file and keep uh, the output from standard out. I can do the opposite, right? So I can keep the output from standard out, right? Sorry, I can redirect the output from uh, the standard out output to a file and, and keep the standard error output. And if you want to do both, well, you can do both as well, right? You just use two redirections, right? So I can output the, I can, sorry, I can redirect standard output to a file and I can redirect standard error to a file, right? And so let's just try that quickly, right? So that one redirects standard output and two greater than redirect standard error, right? And now I get no output to the terminal, but the contents of files.txt Right? That contains the standard, uh, that contains the output from ls, right, where it actually works. And then the output of error.txt, that contains the output of ls where there was an error. Okay, so can you redirect standard in as well? And the answer is yes, but it's a bit unusual, right? So if you want to redirect standard input so that it reads the contents of a file instead of reading the contents of the keyboard, right? So remember standard input's normally hooked up to your keyboard, right? Then you can write zero and then the less than sign uh, and then the name of the file that you want to input, right? Uh, this says after the command, but you can put this anywhere in the command itself uh, and it'll actually work. Right? So, uh, but, 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 but. Right, and remember zero, that's the file descriptor for standard uh, input. Right. So for example, right, now sort normally, uh, normally when you use sort, uh, you normally pass in the name of a file, right? But you, I also showed you in a previous lecture that you can um, provide input to sort from the keyboard, right? So uh, for example, right, if you just type sort, then sort uh, expects you to type stuff on standard input, right? So cat dog, oop, dog, no, cat uh, zebra dog, right? Enter control D and then it does the sort, right? Um, if you want to, sorry, just let me make a file quickly. Uh, uh, I just wanna do, cat, zebra, dog, dog. Okay, so sort will also take an input directly from a file, right? There's a new line in that file, so it shows up first, right? If you really wanted to, you could uh, redirect zero, sorry, zero less than, right? You can redirect standard input, uh, and take input from a file instead, right? So that also works. You normally don't have to do this, right? So it's a bit unusual because most commands, uh, well, most of the commands that we'll use already take their input, uh, already let you provide their inputs as a, uh, um, from a file, right? So if you're redirecting standard input, you, can, you don't need the zero because uh, the default standard input uh, the default file descriptor for the redirection, for redirecting input is to take standard, uh, is to take it from standard input, right? If you want to, you can redirect both the input and the output, right? So this says sort the file unsorted and then output the results to the file sorted.txt, right? Again, that redirection, the input redirection, usually not needed. Right, so you can redirect all of the streams, right, uh, to, uh, so instead of taking input from standard input, you can get input from a file, right, instead of redirecting, uh, instead of printing the normal outputs to the screen, you can send it to a file, instead of printing error messages to the screen, you can also redirect those to a file. Okay, so what else can you do with these, uh, with these commands, right, so instead of sending stuff to a file, Right? Uh, a lot of the time what you want to do is you want to take the output of a command and immediately send it to another command. Right? So for example, uh, so to do that you use the uh, vertical bar. So that's the pipe. Uh, I, I don't know if it's an operator or what it's called. But it's um, use the pipe to connect the output of one command to the input of another command. 
right? So for example, I can take the ls command, right? Its input is some directory name, right? So list the contents of the directory root bin, right? Take that output and send that to the input of the program called less, right? So for example, right? So what happens if I just type ls root bin? I get a whole bunch of stuff, right? If I actually wanted to read all of the output um, one page at a time, that's what the commands less and more are for. Right? So ls root bin, right? Whoa, sorry, control L. Right? Redirect the output of that to the program called less. Right? Now it prints information out one page at a time. Right? So you can actually read what the output is. Press the space bar, it goes forwards. B goes backwards, F also goes forwards, right? And now you can look at the output one page at a time, right? Uh, the command more is similar, right? So I can also redirect the output to more. More behaves uh, in a similar fashion as less. Uh, less actually does, is able to provide, less provides more navigation options for you. So there's a simple example of, uh, there's an example of a simple pipeline. Right? So another example, right? If I want the cow, if I wanna, if I wanna use cow say to print a message, I can print a random message by asking fortune for the random message. Right? So take the output of fortune, right? Send that to cow say, right? Uh, and cow say will uh, print the message uh, that fortune produces. Right, so fortune, pipe, cow say, right, and you get the cow saying you are, uh, you are magnetic in your bearing. Right. And of course you can pass commands, right, so each one of those things that are separated by the vertical bar, those are just commands, right, so whatever command you would normally use, uh, you're allowed to use, right, so if it has options, right, uh, you can specify options to the uh, program, right? So for example, I can ask Kausei to print using, uh, I don't remember now, Stegosaurus is one, right? So you are allowed to pass options to either one of your commands. Right? And you can com connect as many of these as you need to uh, up to the limits uh, that are imposed by the shell. And I actually don't know what those limits are. Right? So here I can list the contents of the directory bin and the direct, uh, contents of the directory user bin, send all of that output to sort, uh, right? So to sort them, uh, to sort the output, so I can see the, all of the files and directories in sorted order, right? And then send that output to less, because there's lots and lots of files. Right? So ls root bin root user bin, right? Uh, and then send that to sort. Right, and then send that to less so that I can actually see what's going on. Right, and if you do that, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of repeated file names. Right, uh, so in bin, right, so it's, it's gonna print uh, the directory bin, then the directory user bin, and there's this file called nf twice, right, bg auth service twice, and so on and so on and so forth. Right, so it actually looks like that uh, bin and user bin, uh, looks like they contain the same files for some reason. Uh, and if you keep on going, you'll see that there, most of the, I think almost everything is duplicated. Right. Let's uh, just take a quick look at, see if we can determine why. Bin, ah yes, we can determine why. Okay, so you might wonder why this is happening, right? Why are there two directories with all the same stuff, right? So if you look at bin, right, on my computer it's shown in green, right? Uh, but the other directories, like home, are shown in blue. Uh, so it turns out that bin isn't really a directory. Right, so if we go and look at what bin actually is, right, uh, bin is what's called a soft link to the directory user bin. And what that means is it's just another name for the directory user bin. Right? Um, so when you list the contents of both directories, you end up listing the contents of user bin twice. So that's, what's actually, that's what's actually what's happening here. Right, so if you're wondering, are there really duplicated files? The answer is no. It just happens to be the case that the directory that looks, the thing that looks like a directory called bin, 
right, is actually pointing to the directory called user bin, right? It's just another name for the directory user bin. Right. Okay, if I want to, I can do something like, uh, I can use this program called WC. So let's see what that does. I don't, have I shown you WC? I don't remember if I've shown you WC yet. So let's, uh, WC. So when I do that, it prints out the number 2313, right? What does WC do? Well, man WC, right? So WC says it prints new lines, word, and byte counts for each file. So in other words, it can tell you how many words are in a file, how many lines are in a file, or how many bytes are in a file, right? So uh, I ask you to use WC on assignment one, or you, yeah, I think I ask you to use WC on assignment one, right? So the, somewhere there's a question that says count how many files there are, just use WC, right? How do I get how many lines there are on the output? Right? You use the option minus L, right? So minus L tells you how many new lines are there in the output, right? So when I list the contents of these two directories, pass the output to sort, and then pass the output to word count, right? It tells you that there are 2,313 lines in the output. All right, uh, can I actually find out how many unique names there are uh, in the output, right? So remember when we printed the results, everything was, there were a whole bunch of duplicated names, right? Is there a way to actually remove the duplicates? The answer is yes. There's this command called unique. Okay, you have to be a little bit careful with unique. So what does unique actually do? Report or omit repeated lines, right? So in other words, it can find the repeat uh, count, or sorry, it can find the repeated lines, or it can remove the repeated lines. However, you have to be very careful about how it works, right? So when you read the description, it says it filters adjacent matching lines from input, right? So in other words, uh, unique works, but it only works if you pass it sorted input, right? So in other words, the lines of the input have to be sorted, right? Because unique just compares adjacent lines, right? Uh, and if you look at the options, you can find out how do I keep, how do I count or keep, sorry, how do I keep uh, the duplicated lines or how do I keep the unique lines, right? Uh, so there's an option for both of those. So if I do this, so if I send the, list the contents of these two directories, send the results to sort, then send the results to unique, right? By default, unique will remove the duplicates, right? So it'll just leave you with one copy of each thing, right? And then pass the results to word count. Now it says there's 1158, right? So roughly half of the files in the two directories uh, are actually unique. Can you find the duplicates? Well, yes, right? So it turns out the option minus D on unique finds the number of duplicated uh, lines. Right? And so if I change, if I just add the option minus D to unique, right? Now we get 1155, right? So of, from all that output from uh, LS, right, passed to sort, right? There are 1,155 duplicated lines. If you sum those two together, you get back the original number of two, what is it, two, three, one, three, right? Uh, and if you're curious as to what, why these aren't exactly the same, right, it's because when you uh, run ls the way you did, it actually prints out the directory names, right? And so uh, the directory names aren't repeated, um, which explains why there are more unique names than there are duplicated names. Oh, okay. Uh, so, oh wait, there's something I have to tell you about the pipelines. Uh, okay. So the pipelines are a bit funny. Um, especially if you are redirecting output to a file. Uh, so one of the common mistakes that people will do is that uh, somewhere in this pipeline, uh, the output will be redirected to a file, right? Now if you redirect output to a file, right, there's nothing to pass on to the rest of the pipeline. So that doesn't work, right? So you have to be careful about that. There is a way to insert a command into the middle, take the output of that command, save it to a file, and then pass the output also 
to the rest of the commands. Right? So that's called a T, and we'll look at that. Um, I don't know if we'll look at it today, but I'll show it to you shortly. Right? Now what you have to remember is, is when you redirect stuff to a f each one of these things in the pipeline, right? the way I've described it to you, it looks like this happens first, then this happens next, then this happens next, then this happens next. That's not what happens. Right? Uh, you actually don't know what the order of these commands run in. Right? So in other words, they can run in any order. However, if a command passes the output, its output to another command, right, then the command that's waiting for the input uh, from the other command will wait for the input. Right? But they start running, you don't know when they start running. Right? So LS, this ls command could start running, right? then unique could start running, then sort could start running, and then word card, uh, wc could start running. Right? The final result is all correct, but you don't know when they start running. That's a problem if you redirect stuff to a file somewhere in the middle of the pipeline. Because right? what a lot of people will do is they'll redirect something uh, in the pipeline, in the middle of the pipeline, to a file. And then they'll expect a command later in the pipeline to read the file. But there's no guarantee that that file that, get, uh, that was redirected to in the middle of the pipeline actually gets written to before the command runs that needs the file. Um, so you have to remember that these don't all start, when the commands start up, they don't start up in the sequence. There's no guarantee that they start up in the sequence that where they're listed. Right? So you, uh, you can't assume uh, that the uh, pieces of the pipeline uh, run first, then second, then third, then fourth. Okay, uh, I have to go back to one of the previous notebooks now. So I should have started this up uh, earlier. I have to, I'm gonna run the online version of the notes, um, but that's gonna take a minute to start up. So I'm gonna go to the command notebook. Uh, there is a part at the end of the command notebook that I didn't mention to you, uh, but it's easy. Uh, the, the content there is easy. Okay, so let me just uh, view, sorry, view, toggle the header, and then toggle the toolbar. All right, so I wanna to go to the command notebook. Uh, instantly, everything in the slides, um, they are, it, all the content is in a notebook somewhere. So if we go to the commands notebook, I just wanna to scroll to the end, because there's something I didn't tell you about that is occasionally useful. Command history, tab completion. So we talked about this last day. List of commands, that's what I want to talk about. Okay, so I didn't, uh, this is, wasn't in any of the lecture slides. Uh, you can create what's called a list of commands in Bash, right? So the pipe uh, operator that I showed you, that's not a list of commands, right? By list of commands, I mean it's an actual sequence of commands. They're not connected to one another, right? So a list of commands is just a sequence of one or more commands separated by a semicolon an ampersand, double ampersand, or double uh, vertical bar. All right. Okay, so the semicolon, you can, you can use that to separate commands, right? So if you wanna type everything in on one, all your commands on one line, you can type in the command semicolon, command semicolon, command semicolon, right? And that just runs it as though you had typed the first command, press enter, then the second command, press enter, and then the third command, press enter. So commands that are separated by a, why is that quoted? I don't know why that's quoted. Commands that are separated by a semicolon are executed sequentially, right? So the first one runs, then the second one runs, then the third one runs. Okay, what about and and or, or what looks like and and or, right? Uh, oh, sorry. That tells you about the operator precedent. That tells you about precedence, okay. Single ampersand after a command. So this one, uh, we don't use this one a lot. Uh, I don't think we actually use this at all in this course. Oh, so it's possible to start a command, uh, a long running command from your shell, right? So for example, if Eclipse was installed on my uh, Ubuntu installation, right? I could start Eclipse from the command line by typing in Eclipse, right? Now if you do that, right? What happens is the shell runs the Eclipse program but then it waits for the Eclipse program to end before you can do anything else with the shell, right? 
which is inconvenient, right? If, uh, if you want to use the shell for something else, right? And so when you run a command in the shell, normally it runs in what's called the foreground, right? So if I run Eclipse from the shell, right, then Eclipse, the program Eclipse runs in the foreground of the shell, right? So that means that nothing happens until the Eclipse program finishes, right? Instead, you can run a, you can run a uh, command or a process in the background, right? What that means is it'll, the shell will launch the command, right? But then the uh, command, so the command will run, uh, but then uh, control comes back to the, control goes back to the shell, right? So in other words, I can run Eclipse in the background, press enter, and then I can use the shell for other stuff, right? If you want to run something in the background, you use the ampersand after the command, right? Generally, you should only do this if you're starting up a uh, long running command uh, that doesn't require you to type anything into the terminal, right? Like Eclipse, because Eclipse, you just use it as a graphical user application, right? Now, because of the way, uh, because of the way we're using uh, Linux in this class, uh, most of you don't, uh, well, any of the Windows users don't have easy access to any of these graphical user interface programs. So we never actually um, use the ampersand in this course. Right. So that's how you'd run Eclipse, for example, if you wanted to start it up from the command line and you still wanted your shell for something else. Right. Double AND, or what looks like double AND. Okay, so if you have two commands, right, with a double ampersand in between, then what this means is, right, run command, sorry, uh, control enter, right, run command one, right, if command run succeeds without any errors, run command two, right? Uh, so the way this works is uh, the, you run command one and then you look at the egg, what's called the exit status of command number one. So whenever you run a command in, uh, uh, in, on Unix, when the command finishes, it returns what's called the exit status back to the operating system, right? Uh, the exit status is just a number. It's, it's always a, a non-negative number, right? So an exit status of zero means that the command succeeded and there were no errors. Any value that's not zero means that the command ran into something unusual um, when it was running, right? Either there was an error, usually it means there was an error, sometimes it means something else has happened, right? Something unusual, right? So if you look at the exit status of a command, I guess I should show you how to do that, right? So ls, that's a command. Right? If you want to look at the exit status of the command, it turns out it's stored in this variable called question mark. Right? Now to get to the value of question mark, you have to put the dollar sign in front. Uh, we'll explain this more in a later lecture. Right? But if you run a command and you want to know its exit status, you can print it by typing in echo dollar question mark. And there you see it prints zero. Right? So the exit status of ls, when I ran it right here, was zero, right? So it means it succeeded, uh, it, uh, it ran without any errors. Right? If I type ls, blah, something like that, right? there is no file named that in this directory, right? you get an error. If you ask for the exit status now, you see that it's not zero, right? So we, here we get two, right? Uh, sometimes the man page will tell you what the exit status means for a command. It doesn't always tell you what all the exit statuses mean. So exit status zero, command ran with no errors. Exit status not zero, command encountered an error. Right? So when you join two commands with and, right, or double ampersand, sorry, right, it runs command one, looks at the exit status. If the exit status is zero, it runs command two. Right? So run command two if command one succeeds. Right? So for example, I could do the following. Right? I can do cd tilde, so that changes to my home directory. If that succeeds, list the contents of the home directory, right? And that should always work because your home directory should always, well, I guess it doesn't always work. You could screw it up, right? So I suppose if you, yeah, I suppose if you change the permissions on your home directory to something strange, this wouldn't work, right? Uh, but, but, but. Okay, so what about this one, right? So here, if I do CD, some directory name where the directory name doesn't exist, right? And, or double ampersand ls, 
right? This one won't work, right? So it'll try to change to that directory, right? If the directory doesn't exist, it stops, right? So if this command does not succeed, uh, then it does not try to list the contents of that directory. Right. Okay, what about the double bar? So the double bar runs command two if and only if command one failed for some reason. So for example, if I try to change to a non-direct, so I, if I try to switch to a directory that doesn't exist, right, so that fails, right, then what do I do? Well, I can make a directory having that name, right? Then I can switch to that directory, and then I can actually print the name of the directory, right? So that directory doesn't exist. Sorry, if that directory doesn't exist, make the directory, then switch to the directory and print its name, right? That will actually work. So if you actually run this, right? So it says, cd, dir name, no such file or directory. So that command failed. Right? And thus we got that output there. Right? That command fails, so all of this stuff happens. Right? So we make a directory with that name, switch to that directory, print its name. Right? So now, if I actually try to do the following, uh, insert a cell below. Right? So now if I do ls in that directory, oops, sorry, and run it, and run it, why is it not? All right, fine. I'll run it in a shell. Okay, so uh, cd, dir name. So that fails, right? Okay, so use double bar, make dir. I'm going to show you how to use make dir uh, in the next lecture. Right, so make the directory. Right, so there's the failure. Right, but now if you look in the directory, there is in fact a directory called dir name. Uh, so, the double bar, execute the second command if the first command failed. Right. Okay, so you will occasionally see, especially if you look up stuff on the internet, um, you'll often see uh, people will recommend you do something and there'll be commands joined together with uh, ands or double ampersands or double bars. Right. Okay. I get, oh, quoting. Let's go look at this notebook now. Uh, so I, I briefly mentioned this in the previous class. Right, so we know that some characters in the shell have special meaning, right? So you know that question mark, star, and space, right? Uh, and yeah, question mark and star, they all have special meanings to the shell, right? So if you try to use those characters um, in some, uh, if you try to use those characters either in a string or in a name or something like that, right? Uh, then you have to tell the shell that uh, those, in this context, I don't want you to treat those as special, right? And that's what quoting is used for. So I want to, yeah, good. Okay, so it turns out there's three things that you can do. You can use the escape character, which is the backslash, right? So backslash some character tells bash to treat the following character as non-special, right? So it says, the backslash preserves the literal value of the next character that follows the backslash, uh, except for new line. So you can't escape a new line character with the backslash. Right. Okay, now the question is, is what on earth is special? Right? So if you go into this notebook and run this command, or run this cell, uh, first of all, it won't make any sense to you at this point in the course because it's using a bunch of stuff that we haven't looked at yet. Right? But if you run this, it'll actually tell you all of the characters that, are, that the shell considers to be special. Right. Okay, so anything that says no character blah does not need to be escaped. That means it's not a special character as far as the shell is concerned. Right, so equals, not special. Underscore, not special. Hyphen, not special, right? So, and so on, and so on, and so on, right? Uh, when you get down to here, you'll see that there are a whole bunch of special characters, right? Not just the ones that I told you about, right? So the back tick, uh, which is hard to find on most keyboards, right, uh, is a special character, right? Caret, less than, greater than, bar, space, comma, semicolon, exclamation mark, right? It goes on and on and on, right? So it turns out there's a whole bunch of characters uh, that you have to be careful about using, 
right? Especially if you put them into a file name, right? Or use them in a string, which we'll see later on. Right. Do, do, do. Okay, so escaping uh, using the backslash uh, is one way to deal with special characters in the file name, right? Uh, I have to switch to, hang on, I have to switch to a directory here. In a lot of the notebooks, you'll see that there's a, a, cell, uh, a, a cell that says run this before using this notebook, right? That switches the directory of the notebook to uh, the specified directory. Okay, so I'll come down to here. So if I run this command, right, uh, you'll see that there's a bunch of funny files, right, in this directory. So there's a file that's got a question mark in it, there's a file that's got an asterisk in it, and there's a file that's got a bunch of spaces in its name, right? When you list these kinds of files, the shell always single quotes them, right? So the single quotes are not part of the file name. If the single quote's part of the file name, then the shell will double quote the, the name, right? So it'll put double quotes around it. All right, what happens if I actually want to look at one of these files, right? So the problem is the file has a special character in it, right? So file with asterisk in name, that's the name of the file, right? Has an asterisk in it, right? If I don't put the asterisk, if I don't escape the asterisk, right? Something funny happens, right? Uh, so, oh, actually this is a really strange one. I shouldn't have, okay. So, something odd happens here. So each file, let me escape it again. Okay, so each one of those files consists of one line, right? The file that has the asterisk in it, the one line in the file is avoid using star in file names, right? The one with the question mark says, it has one line in it, it's avoid using the question mark in file names. And the one with the spaces in it, it has one line in it. It says avoid using spaces in file names, right? If I remove the, back tick, uh, the backslash here, right, then star, right, what does star mean in a file name, right? So it means match anything in this, match all file names, uh, sorry, match any string in this position, right? So try to find the files that have any string in this position, right? So starts with file underscore with underscore, followed by anything, followed by underscore in name, right? And there's two files in the directory that match that pattern, right? There's this one and there's this one, right? And so when I run this command, it actually outputs the contents of both files, right? Which, prob which in this case isn't what we wanted, right? What happens if I remove, oops, sorry. What happens if I remove the escape, the backslash in this example? Right? So when you run this one, it also prints out the contents of both files. Why? Because the question mark matches any single character. So it matches uh, file with star in name and it matches file with question mark in name. Right? And if you delete the escape uh, character here, uh, this is going to give you a really bizarre error message, I believe. Right? Cat says there's no file called file. There's no, call, call, there's no file called with, or spaces, uh, or in, or name, right? So the space is used to, spec, uh, to separate arguments, right? So here, you're asking cat to list the contents of that, 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 and that, right? And those files don't exist, right? So you can use the backslash to uh, escape special characters. You can also use single quotes, but you have to be, a, uh, but single quoting and double quoting mean different things in bash. So single quote, if you single quote a string, then everything inside the string is just treated as those were the characters in the string, right? So in, every, in other words, everything inside loses its special meaning, right? And you might think, well, I always want to do this, but the answer is, is you almost, uh, you usually don't want to single quote, right? Okay, so even inside the single quotes, backslash loses its meaning, right? So backslash does not work inside single quotes. Now, if everything loses its meaning inside single quotes, that also means uh, you can't put a single quote inside of a pair of single quotes, right? So if you have a name or a string where you need to have a single quote in it, you have to double quote that thing instead, right? So all of those examples where I was using escape, I can now just wrap the file name up with single quotes, 
Right? And this tells the shell that's not a special character in this context. Right? So this works. Right? Right? Again, tell the shell that the question mark is not special. Tell the shell that the spaces are not special. Right? So those all work. Now what about the double quotes? So it turns out usually what you want to do is you want to double quote stuff, especially when you start to write shell scripts that use variables. Right? So double quotes preserve the literal values of the characters inside the quotes except for right, question mark, or sorry, dollar sign. That's the important one. The back tick, which is not important for this course because we're not going to use the back tick. This is a mistake if you're reading the notebooks. Uh, I didn't see this one until today. Uh, there should be two backslashes here. So if you double click on that cell, you can edit it and then stick in the second backslash. Right? So the backslash keeps its meaning, uh, or sort of keeps its meaning inside double quotes. Question mark so, uh, sort of keeps its meaning if you have history expansion enabled. Right? Remember exclamation mark some number will uh, run a command from your history. Backslash doesn't quite work the way you expect it to inside of double quotes, right? The only characters that you can escape using backslash are the dollar sign, the back tick, the backslash, and the double quote, and the new line, right? So you can't escape all of the special characters, you can only escape some of them. Turns out double quoting is the more common of the methods, uh, of the quoting methods, right? Uh, especially when you start to use variables. That dollar sign, it's weird coming from Python or Java, right? If you want to get the value of a variable, you put the dollar sign in front of the variable name, right? So if I want to access the value of the variable x, right, then I need to write dollar x, right? Um, if the value of dollar x contains a special character in it, right, that you don't want to treat as being special, then you have to quote the dollar x, right? You have to quote use the use of the variable name. Right, which is really weird coming from other languages, but that's the way it works in Bash. Right, so double quoting is very common uh, in Bash, uh, and it prevents things like word splitting and file name expansion when you're using a variable. Right, so if you run these again, these all work the way you expect them to. Right? Okay, uh, I think that's a good place to stop for today. So we're not, I'm not going to start a different notebook. Uh, and we will uh, pick this up next lecture. How's the assignment going? Any questions? Any problems? Okay, good.